Praise the Lord. All right, today in the Word of God, uh, I want to thank the Lord for two, two Sundays ago, Minister Michael Mack ministering the Word in our absence. So can we give God thanks for him? And one Sunday ago, last Sunday, uh, Latricia ministered in my absence. Uh, I want to thank the Lord for her ministering as well. And um, you've been kind and gracious. So if you will turn your Bibles to the book of James chapter 3. And then stand with us if you will. We have a subject that perhaps you hear a lot about. But it's so vital to our or reverence and respect for God whom we serve. And I hope and I pray that today uh, each one of us will not necessarily see or hear the messenger, but to hear what the Lord is saying through his word by his precious spirit. And if you have James chapter 3, we're going to read the first 12 verses. Beginning at verse 1, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame, it is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can, Can the, the fig tree, my, my brethren, brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine, figs? So, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. fresh. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank you. We are in your presence and in the company of your holy angels. We do thank you. And we do bless you. And we fully acknowledge your Holy Spirit today in the spirit of Christ among us. We pray that you will be glorified as you observe, O oh Lord God, the order in our lives today. We pray that it will be acceptable in your sight. We thank you. Thank you for those that are under the sound of our voice. 
Guide and instruct to me through the Holy Spirit that I may say only what you desire me to say. Thank you for the body. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I commended uh, Minister Michael Mack for ministering. As my wife shared that she was going somewhere on yesterday. She came back and she shared her experience just a, a little while ago about what the Holy Spirit was saying to her. And we were going, uh, where were we going on yesterday? Picnic, yes, thank you. And we were talking, we normally talk about the word or talk whatever when we're in the car, my wife, Jesse, and myself. And it gets a nice conversation because God began to illuminate, open up things to us when we began to keep our conversation holy. So this was one such moment. And, uh, but I remember him saying that if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And that thing gripped my heart like, I said, wait a minute, I need to visit this scripture. He said, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But then he goes on to say, but if we, he implies that if we don't judge ourselves, then he judges us. And let's go to the scripture which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So I'm coming back to the tongue now. We'll be talking about words in the tongue but this is uh, I wanted to do just a little teaching concerning respect for the Lord and his body the Lord's Supper is what is being represented here and so if you're there say amen verse 20 Verse 28, when he was talking about the Lord's Supper, drinking and eating unworthily in an unworthy manner, if a person does it, really not discerning and respecting what the Lord's Supper represents, then he says the person becomes guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. So follow with me because this is so very important. Verse 28 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. The next line says, What? Everybody, can you see that? Verse 29, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, notice what he said. He that eat and drink unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, look at verse 30, very important. For this cause, everybody see that? For this reason, not discerning properly what the Lord's Supper meant concerning his body, right? For this reason or for this cause, this is what he said, many are weak and sickly among you. This is the body. Everybody see that? And many sleep, which means many die. What he's basically implying, saying, is that many die prematurely. Yeah. 
not properly discerning the Lord's body. It speaks of the Lord's Supper, what it implies, and it speaks of the Lord's sacrifice, and it also speaks of his church, right? Which is the body of Christ. I want you to follow with me because this is really, really uh, important. I feel like God was opening this thing to help me to look at it and see it. And not only to see it for myself, but to, 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 to teach it so that we can respect the things of God and not end up being judged and going through unnecessary changes or trials and tribulations because we have not properly discerned what the body of Christ is all about. All right, now look what he says. Verse 31, cause or for, if we would judge our neighbor, if we would judge the deacons, if we would judge the pastors, if we would judge the members, Everybody see that? If we would judge ourselves, it's then that we would not be judged. Now, you and I know the, what, to, to imply something. Something is sometimes it's things that's not said that carries the weight. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What he didn't say is when we judge others, when we judge the body of Christ, we're chastened of God. Look at verse 32. And when we are judged, that is, if we don't judge ourselves, then God has to judge us. Are you with me? And when we're judged, we're chastened of the Lord, disciplined of the Lord, so that we should not be condemned with who? You, are, are you hearing what I'm saying? This has not to do with a brother or a sister. After you or after me. This has nothing to do with that. It has to do with understanding and honoring and respecting Jesus Christ and his body. That's what it's all about. So now if I don't properly understand the, res or the body of Jesus Christ, that it is his body, right? I could talk about his body in such a way not understanding what I am truly doing. Are you with me? Because I have not properly understood that the saints, the wicked saints, no matter how feeble they are, if they are truly born again, washed in the blood of Christ, they are a part of the body of Christ. Isn't that right? So if I keep talking about them, running them down and so on, then what happens is I have not properly discerned that they are part of the body of Jesus Christ. So then I am not discerning his body. I am treating the, the body of Christ with disrespect, not understanding what I'm doing. What are you saying? So now, since I didn't properly discern, since I didn't properly discern and, uh, and judge my behavior, God has to judge me. So I face unnecessary things because I have not properly understood what's going on in my life. I've always said if I'm facing things constantly, constantly, praying about it, fast about it, and it doesn't go away, then it's time for me to say, okay, somewhere I'm not paying attention to what God is saying to me personally. Not to my brother, but to me. So the Lord was saying to me that many are suffering because he's having to deal with us. And so now that's why I said on Wednesday, 
when we're going through things repeatedly, we meet, we, we want to stop and say, Lord, what's going on? Is something that I'm not getting? Is there something I'm not understanding? Is there somewhere I'm creating an offense and don't understand? And the Bible says, if any man like wisdom, let him do what? Let him ask of God. He gives so freely. He so willingly wants to give us understanding. So we must ask. Okay. So I want to do a little teaching about the Lord's Supper. This is what I felt God was saying. Key thing in mind, if we would judge ourselves. What do you mean judge yourself? Okay. The Bible says in the day of prosperity, rejoice. Hallelujah. That's in the Old Testament. But he said in the day of calamity, consider. That means pause and begin to think. Okay, Lord, what's going on in my life? Is there something, is there something you, you're trying to get through to me? And then when, when I do this, then God will begin to talk to me and show me. Uh, and if it's a matter of wisdom, then he'll give me wisdom and insight where I didn't have it. So now if I properly discern, and then once I get what God is saying, if I begin to correct that, right? Then this trial has no reason to continue. Now, hear what I'm saying. It has no reason to continue now because I judged myself. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I judged myself. So when I judged myself, God didn't have to judge me. I was like, wow. Wow. Wow, Lord. So the Lord wants our, the body to understand this so that we can properly operate in, 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 in this. Now, let, let me see. Let me share this briefly because I'm going back to the other part. He says, Paul reminds them of what the Lord's Supper was meant to be. How it began, a tradition carefully passed from one person to another. Now look what he said. Okay, in, in, in verse 23, Paul said, he, he said, for, this is what Paul was saying. Now it was passed down to him, part of the tradition, okay? For I've received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now this is how, this is how it got started. Look at somebody said, this is how it got started. Okay. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat. This is my body. This is my what? Body. Which is broken for you. Then he said, look at this. This do or do this in what? In remembrance of me. Now you see the attitude of what God wants us to do, understanding that he wants to have concerning the Lord's Supper. This was, this was what, now what happened in the, in, in the days of old, the reason Paul said it because, was because that they was treating the love feast and the Lord's Supper with such disrespect and dishonor. And Paul said, You are not properly discerning. You're eating and taking the Lord's communion, but you're doing it unworthy because you're not discerning that this is God's body. This is the body of Christ. This is not just anything. And so it must be treated with great reverence and respect. Isn't that right? Just understanding what it means. Christ died for our sins. So when I'm taking communion, all of this is in, in my understanding, in my memory. It's, it's a holy moment, isn't that right? It's a moment of great reverence. Now, that's one part, but the other part is this. My life now must line up with what I really believe. If I'm saying I honor the Lord, I understand what Christ did, and I'm cursing and swearing and lying and stealing, putting people down, hating one another, but it's the body I'm doing this to. It's his body I'm doing this to. 
Not just an individual. Everybody hear what I'm saying? Not just an individual. It's his body that I'm doing this to. Now, let, let, let me, look what you remember Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Oh, he thought he was doing the right thing. Boy, he was persecuting the church. And then on his road to Damascus, all of a sudden a bright light shone from heaven. Knocked him off of his animal. When he finally came to himself, he says, he heard a voice. And it says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting the church? Why are you persecuting those little Christians over there? He didn't say that. He said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, you know that he didn't understand what he was doing. And then he said, who are you, Lord? Yeah, this has got to be some mistake here. I'm too dedicated. You, 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 you. you. You, you got this thing wrong. Make me understand what you're saying. This, this light is coming from heaven. And so then he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Do you know what that must have done to this man? And then he said a very humbling good thing. What will you have me to do? What do you want me to do? Come on, give God some praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's one thing when the Lord rebukes us, but how we respond is another thing. He could have said, I don't believe that. Wait a minute. I, uh, uh. You got it wrong here. But what he said, what would you have me to do? Now, the, the, the light had blinded him. He couldn't even see. So he told him, go and where'd he go? Somebody's going to lay hands on you. Well, look at somebody say, it's not all the time bad when somebody lay hands on you. <laughs> the great apostle. Paul had to have an ordinary person lay hands on him. Cornelius laid hands on him. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus give you sight. Scales fell off of his eyes. He became seeing again. Sometimes God has to let us run into things that we cannot so handle until we can stop and begin to hear him. This thing was made so real to me. I said, my God. And all of my laboring today is that the body would grasp what's being said. I know I can't win a popularity contest. That's not why I'm in the kingdom. But if I, I got to tell you this. This week, and I'm going to get back to the text. This week, um, my wife and I was blessed. Someone from the Suffolk ministry came. They planted a seed or gift and then the words that they said conclusively really blessed me. They'd gone through a lot, struggled, and for a while it looked like they weren't going to get it. But then Jesus Christ appeared to this person. And one, one evening or one night, they were thinking so little of themselves. 
wondering if God really accepted them because of their feebleness, because of their weakness. And there they saw Jesus in a vision and dressed in white. And he spoke to them. How you doing? He didn't speak like we would think Jesus would speak. Hello. <laughs> he just says, how you doing? They were startled because they were just going through some doubts in their mind whether or not Jesus really loved them or whether he was, what he was going to say to them. And he spoke words of acceptance to that person that just blew them away. And their life began to change. So they came by, gave a seed. God had blessed them with some monies. But here's what they said to me and my wife. Thank you for telling me the truth. Oh, that touched my heart. Wow. I said, out of all these 40 years, I don't know if I've ever heard that. Somebody came to me and said, thank you for telling me the truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No, don't think, don't thank me. Oh, you, you preach good. Don't, don't, you know, no, no, no. But thank you for telling me the truth. You can imagine how I felt. I said, God, I thank you. So I just wanted to share that with you. Hallelujah. Our attempt today is to tell the truth because it's the, the truth. That's going to liberate us. It's the truth that's going to liberate us. And uh, so I'm grateful to the Lord. But the teaching of the Lord's Supper was the thing that part of the first party wanted me to do. So Paul reminds them. Them of what the Lord's Supper was meant to be. How it began and a tradition carefully passed down. So it was passed down on to Paul. Paul was passed on down to Paul. It began with Jesus taking bread, a prayer of thanksgiving, saying, this is my body, just broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Don't do this just out of a tradition. Right? Do this in remembrance of him. Right? Then he said, this is my cup. This, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. A new covenant which is sealed with his blood. Remember the old covenant where when God um, uh, spoke to Moses and, and he read the law and then he took and sprinkled, Moses sprinkled the blood after he had read the law to the children of Israel. He took the blood and just sprinkled on the people, right? And, um, but this covenant is the new covenant representing that which was new. And it was very, very important to God and to us. The new covenant. And so it's the new covenant in my blood. And uh, he says, uh, verse 25, after the, uh, the same matter, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the new testament in my blood. This do, this do ye, as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me, right? And for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he come. Okay. So, Paul then moves on to give some warnings and instructions of when this tradition is done in an unworthy manner. When there is the lack of love, the factious spirit, greed and contempt for one another, it's sin against Christ himself and his church. So before taking it, it is important to check our motives as well as the moral and spiritual condition. I take it, understanding what I'm doing. Okay, that part I just wanted you to see the Lord was sharing with me. So bottom line, after all that was said and done concerning that part, 
If we would judge ourselves, look at somebody say, if we judge ourselves, then God won't have to judge us. Very important, everybody. Okay. Now, go back to James 3. I realize our time now is, we don't want to keep you too long, but. Uh, in this book of James here, it, it is said that it was written somewhere around uh, the 40s or 43, 45 in the year of the Lord or A.D. One of the first books, or if not the first book in the New Testament written. Some 20 years or more later, there was a book of 1 Peter written. James wrote to the strangers scattered abroad. Isn't that right? Peter wrote to the 12 tribes or to the, the strangers scattered, the diaspora, or those that were dispersed, right, of the Jews 20, some 20 years later. And Hebrews, somewhere 20 to 25 years later or before the fall of Jerusalem, here came the book of Hebrews written to the Jews. All right? So in the 40s, James wrote, and as James wrote to the Christians, as I started reading, I said, what the thought came to me is, observe the conditions now, because God's word don't just come, right? And I, if, if it comes from God, it must come to either instruct or correct, right? Or to inform. It's got to serve a purpose, right? It's not going to just come if a person is really seeking the Lord for what he wants said, then when it comes forth, then we hear it and, and apply it to our lives because this is coming from the Lord. So the Lord is saying here, uh, uh, and you heard, I think for those that were here on two Sundays ago, you heard as Max sought the Lord, God gave him that. As Teresa sought the Lord, God gave her that. Out of the mouth of two or uh, Three witnesses, let what? Every word be established. So look at somebody says, so it's no longer about Pastor Herring. Isn't that right? It's him talking to us. So that's what I want you to emphasize. So uh, James was talking here and uh, the condition of the people. Now I want you to follow with me now. Don't, don't, don't leave anybody. Some of the conditions here, okay? So, so that you can understand why James said some of the things that he said. Now, before I say that, in, in the book of Israel, when I read through the book of uh, the, the, the God Bible, I was like, God, what's wrong with Israel? Man, I, how could they do this? They didn't know who they were serving. I was so frustrated. It was like, and, and, and as a young, young Christian, as I read through the Bible and kept reading through the Bible, I was, I said, you know, it's just not fair for somebody like God to have to be laboring with people and pleading with them, almost like begging them. It's like, do they know who they were serving? And I felt like this is so bad. He don't deserve that disrespect. And right then and there in my little young heart, I said, God, you're not going to have that problem out of me. As I read through the Bible, the God of all creation, and all he just kept reaching out, just kept reaching out, wanting to do him good. And Israel would just go right back into backsliding over it. He'd deliver them. They cried, Lord, 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 forgive me. Oh, God, I'm sorry. Please, if you help me out this year, God, I'll serve you. And so finally, after much pleading, God delivered them. He raised up a deliverer, and he delivered them completely from their hands of their enemies. Gave them their freedom back, right? After the deliverer died, went right back into it. And I saw that pattern. I said, Lord, it is not fair for people to treat you that way. I'm, I'm, I'm young in the Lord. And then I read about Josiah. It blessed my heart. Young kid, eight years old, came to the throne. 
And he read that law and he cried, wept. And then God said to Hilda the prophetess, he said, God, go, go seek the prophet, the prophetess for Israel. We're in trouble, man. But the way we've treated God's law. So he sent them to inquire of the Lord. And then she said, go back and tell the, the man that sent you, talking about Josiah. Yeah, I'm, I'm on deal. I'm going to bring evil upon this place. This kind of thing he was talking about because of Israel's sin. But he said, but as for you, because when you read my word, you cried, wept, it touched your heart. You were sorry for the sins. He said, I'm not going to let you see the evil. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? He said, little Josiah, because you had a tender heart toward me when you heard my word, I'm not going to let you see the evil. Oh, I'm going to do it. But you're going to gather with your people, and you're going to see good days. That's Old Testament. I know, right? But it does speak something about the Lord, right? And so, but these are some conditions. Bear with me. As I'm reading through James. First, you look at chapter one. All right. He said, James, the servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, right? Greeting. Then he said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. You got to keep rejoicing. I don't care. No matter. Even if you're guilty of doing some things wrong, you still got to learn to rejoice because God still deserves the, pra the praise and the respect and the honor that's due his name. Isn't that right? Let's pause and give him some praise right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. You're still God. You're still the most high. You're still the sovereign Lord of glory. You're still the great lion of the tribe of Judah. Nothing about you change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, when they went into the presence of a king, they had to go in respect because of who the king was, right? Because if they didn't go in with respect, they wouldn't get in. They wouldn't even get in. So there was a way that they were to approach the great king, kings of the day. They had to come in with respect. Most noble king, most noble lord, your majesty. They had to go because he deserved the honor, right? And so God always deserve the honor and respect no matter what how we view things and we, we our, our our view is narrow isn't that right we, we we can't understand the vastness of god so we must continue to give him praise in spite of what we don't see what we don't want to do is get bitter and and and, and, and don't want to praise him don't want to give him honor and glory to uh, which do his name and and attribute the wrong thing to god isn't that right? we don't want we don't want to do that because that's never the right thing. The Bible says God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. Look at somebody say he's never done you no wrong. You got to always give him the praise. Always give him the glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. I, I got to pause. I got to pause and tell you this because sometimes we go through things. We started looking cross-eyed at God. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you don't hear what I'm saying? He does us nothing but good. He doesn't deserve no lies. You know what I'm saying? He's good. He is good. Always laboring to help us. Always trying to help us. 
Always trying to give us some wisdom and insight into our situation. Always willing to bail us out. Even when we got in, in our own selves. He's good. So what are you saying, Brother Herod? I'm saying always remember to give him respect and glory and honor. Let's do his name. Hallelujah. One of the reasons why some people stay in their trials so long is because they fail to give God glory when they're going through. Because of the enemy makes them feel God is doing this to you and, and he's the one. But he's telling you now so that you won't praise God. God is doing this to you. Yeah, if God loves you, he wouldn't let this happen. It's on and on and on. But the bottom line is to get you to disrespect the one that loves you so much. But when you praise, you break his old lies. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. I've seen it too many times in the spirit. Sit up there with his old lies trying to trick you. And then... When I decided to praise God, his face changed. Looking mad and mean at me. You know, because he, he couldn't trick me. You know, no, I'm not saying it happened every time, because sometimes he tricked me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Tell the truth and shame the devil. Hallelujah. But Satan is always a trickster, and I don't want to say much about him, because he doesn't deserve my lips. But God is always good. He's always good. And right now, I just feel God is, is laboring to tell us how much he cares. It's the enemy that's tried to make him look bad. He's a good God. He's a good Savior. And if you'll serve him, Your life will never be the same. Hallelujah. 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 All right. I'm finally getting to the conditions of the readers. I need somebody to say, man, you forgetting, you know. I ain't forgetting. Listen, listen to some of the, the conditions now, according to the word, that this letter went to the recipients, Okay. Verse, before I do that, James, he said, verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, right? But let patience have her perfect work that you may be what? Perfect and entire warning or lacking nothing. So there was some lack. Are you, are you with me? It, it, so it said there's lack and God wanted to fulfill that lack and begin to bring the church up where they were uh, not up to standard. Everybody see what I'm saying, right? So this is what he's saying, okay? So now, just, this, now don't get mad at God and just well, go on through because God's allowing this to happen for a purpose, isn't that right? He's doing something to get our full attention and to purge us and to purify us where we need purifying. If it's a matter of disrespect, he's saying, I got to bring you to the knowledge and understanding that God is to be respected at all times, isn't that right? It may be a situation where I'm having problems with my tongues. If I'm having problems with my tongue, then God is saying, I want you to understand there's a reason you're going through with hope that you're going to come to me and say, God, what's the deal? So I can tell you what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And then when it's corrected, he says, things will change. Now, I know I preach hard, y'all, so don't throw no stones. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to do the best I can, all right? All right. All right. <laughs> Every time God is speaking to me about a certain thing, okay, God, I got you, got you. All right, at the top of my notes, H-U-M-I-L-I-T-Y. I I write it on the side, H-U-M-I-L-I-T-Y. Now, for those who don't understand, I'm talking about humility, okay. (laughs) So I get up there. It's okay, now what I'm going to do I'm going to do it this way. So I started 
trying to teach. And people start going to sleep on me. <laughs> it's like the Lord says, son, it ain't about you. It ain't even about you. It's about my spirit. That lives with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. The conditions now, I want to establish that the fact there was a need, right? Uh, the need of maturity, right? That's what that word perfect means. Basically, that you may be mature and entire, not lacking nothing. So there was immaturity. Okay. Verse 8 in James 1 talks about instability. All right? So if a person is unstable, if instability is going on, then that person is not stable. One, they don't know what they want. They glorify the Lord today and they want what? Something else tomorrow. They're not stable. They don't know what they want. They're restless. Everybody with me? So if, if a person is unstable, God's got to deal with that, right? You say, well, why has God to deal with that? Well, I mean, you, 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 because you can't be trusted yet. Can I tell the truth? If you're unstable, you can't be trusted yet. Oh, man, I'm preaching hard. I know that, but I, I, I'm trying to share something with you here. It's like, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so the devil knows that we're unstable. So he said, hey, let, let me go and hey, let me go and punch their blow their bubble. He goes up there and lets something happen. And all that little praising the Lord went straight out the window. <laughs> Ready to curse God to his face. Instability. Don't know yet who we're serving. We don't yet know he's good. And here's another example. Okay, here's a person. That, okay, I'm going to seek God. I'm going to seek God. So they give God a week. If God don't come through, they got their fist up at him. I'm being humorous, you follow, but you follow what I'm saying, right? Instability. So the devil knows that. So you can't do much for God doesn't mean that he don't want to use us, right? He want to use everybody. But he don't want to be embarrassed in the process. Isn't that right? <laughs> they say, you, 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 you a Christian, you say you? What you doing back there in the bar? I mean, uh, we, okay, you meddling, ain't you, but I heard, okay. <laughs> okay, no. What are you doing sitting up there with the, with the, with the, <laughs> A fifth in your hand. You, you. But y'all get what I'm trying to say. So he said, kind of all joy. Go ahead and let patience have his perfect work. I know you're going through. But James said, he wants you to be, become more mature. So that you can recognize the devil for who he is. Isn't that right? When you see him come and says, devil, don't even try it. I see you and you ain't going to do this to me. Sometimes there are things that the devil, he, he knows that he can just get, make us mad. Boom, 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 boom. And, and so, you know, have you ever, have you ever done this? Okay, boy, you're going to get spiritual. You're going to pray and fast for a few days. Ah, boy, you're feeling real good now. Right. So the devil throw a brick at you. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> What do you laugh? What do you, what do you say, Brother Heron? <laughs> the times that we begin to serve the Lord, I remember times that <laughs> I would fast, man. I'd go on a fast six, seven days, man. Boy, after seven days, I'm feeling real, real spiritual. <laughs> okay, I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, let's go back. Okay, so he's instability. Okay, verse 8, look what he says. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Are you with me? So there's instability, there's double-minded too. Okay, so a double-minded person is a person that wants what the world has to offer and they want sometimes what God has to offer. Right? Person says, okay, I want the Lord, I want this year. But, the, but so the devil knows that when they're double-minded that if God does not do for them what he does for Sally and John Doe, they're going to get mad or they're going to get envious of Johnny and Sally. I remember going through years ago, seeking the Lord with my whole heart. It looked like God was blessing everybody. Blessing everybody. This is, that was my perception. Blessing everybody but me. But that wasn't reality. But it just wasn't my time for what he had in mind, right? So it was hard to see and bless others and thank God for how he blessed others because I was so desirous my own self, right? And, uh, but God had to get me beyond that point. He said, rejoice with them that rejoice. When you see a brother or sister get blessed, be happy for them. Be happy for them. Don't feel envious and feel like, uh, you know, like the world does and they think they something. You know what I'm saying? You haven't seen people do that? They think they something, you know. And all the person is trying to do is just like you, just trying to serve the Lord. Y'all with me? So all of these attitudes God had to get rid of because it's not becoming of a Christian, right? So go back to what he said. We judge ourselves, right? Say, God, how am I as a Christian? What, what, what if the whole church was just, just like me? What, what kind of church would it be? Would it self-destruct in a little while or... Just a thought. Y'all follow what I'm saying? If we would judge ourselves, then God wouldn't have to judge us. Oh my God, God, I thank you. All right, going back to the other thing. There was instability, there was double mindedness. Now I want you to look at James 4. Follow with me now, I'm going to do this quickly. James 4, verse 9. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. And your joy to heaviness. Okay, I went, let me go back to eight. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, double-minded. The James, right? God was having to deal with them because there was double-mindedness. Today they didn't want God, today we want something else. Okay, all right. So there was, some were rich among them and some were poor. The rich disrespected the poor. The rich had a way of boasting and bragging. Uh, tomorrow I'm going down to uh, 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 Atlanta, and I, I'm going to kind of live there for about a year. And, uh, and I'm going, I'm, you know, I'm going uh, uh, tap into some of the resources down there in Atlanta. And then, uh, you know, not even considering their lives. So that's how they did. They were boasting. Yeah, I'm going out to let. I'm already planning to do this. I've been, you know, I've been located the place. Ain't consulted God. Ain't done none of that. But just boasting. Yeah, I got an investment, so I'm going to do so and so. So that's what they were doing in James' day. The rich, the well to do. So he said, that kind of boasting. He says it's evil. So, all right. So some were rich and some were poor. The rich were despising the poor, and they'd come into a person's assembly. There was. Let me go on. Okay. They were hasty. And impulsive in speech, according to James 3, okay? They were hearing the truth, some of them, but not applying it. Not all of them, but some of them. And the fact that they were hearing the truth, they felt, I'm, I'm, I'm right where the Lord wants me. 
Because they were hearing the truth. And they felt good about the truth. I know what God is saying, right? But they were not, say it with me, doing it. They were not doing it. And so as far as God is concerned, they weren't even hearing. But this is what was happening. This is the people to whom the, the letter was written to, okay? All right, now what else? They had respect of persons, okay? They had a, they had a desire to, 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 to rub shoulders with the well-to-do. So James said, they come into your assembly, man with gate coat clothing. Boy, look at this dude, man. Like that one lady said, boy, that's that, that, that silver fish that I've dreamed about, you know. That's that handsome fellow that I would, you know what I'm saying. But looking and seeing people that look like they dress nice, look like they had a few dollars, you know what I'm saying. Hey, brother, yeah, brother, come on, you know, you sit up here near me. So your person come in there and look like he didn't have a change of clothing. But that brother be in the back. Don't let nobody see him. You know, just, you know, respect of persons. God says, James said, but you despise the poor. It's the poor that are rich in faith. And are heirs of God. All this was in the church now. All this was in the church that James, and, and to the strangers that were scattered, they were scattered everywhere, you know, uh, the Jews. But he had to speak to them, and they were really going through, and they couldn't understand. 20 years later, somewhere or another, 20 some years later, uh, Peter wrote. And many of them were still going through, right? He said, count it all joy when you fall into I was temptation knowing this that the trying of your faith works patience, right? The writer of Hebrews somehow written a little later. And at this point, they were tired. They were ready to turn back. Forget it. Forget this. They had, some of them had lost some of the possessions. Persecutions had, had arisen. And they forgot all this glory that came about when they first got saved. And many of them said, man, maybe we missed it. Maybe this was some kind of myth, some kind of loose, some kind of... Uh, uh, we were off on a tangent. Maybe this was some kind of tangent we off. This whole thing about, about Jesus. You know what I mean? So some of them were wanting to turn back. And the Hebrew writers began to say, look, you're under a better covenant. And so he had to talk about the high priesthood role. He had to talk about all those things. But I'm just kind of uh, progressing and letting you see in a progressive manner how if they didn't deal with the problems during James' day, they even got worse, right? So if we don't deal with the things that God is dealing with us now, then they get worse. They don't get better unless we address them, right? We've got to address them. Okay, all right, let me go on here. I'm coming, so I'm getting along. So they were hearing the truth and not applying it. They had respect of persons. The first half of chapter 2 deals with that. The last half of chapter 2 deals with having faith without works. Not practical enough, all right? And that can happen too. You know, somebody, a person can have faith and they're not practical, right? Uh, uh, they, 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 they're spiritual minded, but they don't have a uh, practicality to their life. And sometimes, believe it or not, I tell you, there's some people that are not even saved. They're more practical minded. And so some of them, they begin to look at the Christians and say, boy, they're warped. You know, Christians are warped because they're not practical. Their mind is in the cloud. You know what I'm saying? You heard people say that? So we have to be practical as people of God, right? There's a practical side. You know, you know we not only just skip our way up to heaven, we, 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 we love the Lord and all of that things here, but we got to be down here because we live down here. Isn't that right? Come on, let's give God some praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. God is so good. Okay, so these were some of the things that was taking place, and uh, they despised the poor. They were showing no mercy. So now here, these were Christians. So God had to address these situations because of the many problems that were among them. Now, so we look at James 3 now. This is, look at what he's saying. And among those, among those 
things that he dealt with, one of the things that was really major was, was, was the tongue. So I want you to follow me. Look at verse 19 in chapter 1. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Isn't that right? Slow to wrath. All right? Look at verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is empty, vain, futile. Okay, look at chapter 3 now. All right, let's go back over it again. James 3, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. He's dealing with, sometimes uh, the study said he was dealing with um, some of the false teachers that were among them as well, that were presuming to be teachers. They weren't called to that office. And, uh, but then he comes right back to, in a general sense, he said, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, everybody with me? The same as a mature man or a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. See, how I handle my speech, how I, how I in everyday life and as a Christian, how I, how I can monitor and control my speech tells the world how I really am. If I say, oh, I love the Lord. Nobody can tell me. No, 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 no. You can't tell me. No, 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 no. I love the Lord. God speaks to me. I don't know something. But if on a daily basis I talk so much that people don't want to hear me, <laughs> that's telling me how I really am. It's showing me my true heart. So what James was dealing with, it's like he says, you can't fool me. If you're a wise person, here's how a wise person in deal with knowledge operates. A person that has heavenly wisdom, this is how they operate. But a person with earthly wisdom, this is how they operate. And their wisdom divides people. But wisdom that comes from God does not divide. Are you hearing me? I remember God was dealing with me about a, a certain person years ago. This person looked like they were really, really being used of God and so on. But they had a trail of dividing the church. And I was, I was torn. I was like, God, I know this person really, they love the Lord. So I can't, you know, da, 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 da. So the Lord says, check their track record out. And everywhere they went, it left a trail of chaos and confusion. I was like, oh. Wow. I said, okay, I'm going to leave that alone. So our actions speaks louder than our words. Okay. All right. James, he says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body behold also the ships which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds yet are they turned about with a very small helm a rudder whatsoever the governor please or the pilot even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things behold how great a matter a little fire kindles and a tongue and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity so is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. Every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. God. This was a man, this thing is in my mouth. 
The tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Now somebody would say, no, 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 no. I got grace, so no, 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 no. It is true. But my will hadn't been taken away from me. As long as my will is to do opposite of what the word says, it's the wrong kind of wisdom, right? All right. Now, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm about done. Uh, he says, once again, every kind of beast and of birds and of serp serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed. A man, can, oh my God, he said a snake is tamed. Did y'all see that? And of serpents, that's a snake. You can tame a snake. Okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> but the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father. And therewith curse we men which are made in the image or similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. Brethren, these things ought not so to be. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree, brethren, bear olive bears, either vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh. Let it be a, a, a fountain of salt water or a, a, a fountain of fresh water, but it can't be both, right? So it's confusion. What he's basically saying is that as a Christian, our tongues are to be used to bring life and health. Isn't that right? So if it brings deadly poison and cursing people, that thing is like a double fountain. It cannot, it was not purpose, it was not made to be a double fountain. It must be what God intended for it to be. So now, so now, what am I going to do when I'm hearing the truth? Am I going to go back? He says, I don't care what he says. Am I going to do that before God who's given the word? Or am I going to humble myself and say, I hear you talking to me, God? Okay, all right. So, okay, the tongue, look at what he said in, 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 in uh, chapter 4, verse 11. Y'all with me? Okay. He says, speak not evil one of another, brethren. Wait a minute now, wait, wait. You talking to brethren? Brethren, don't do that. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges brother speaks evil of the law and judge the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer, but you're a judge. God, there's one judge, right? There's one lawgiver, one judge. Who's able to save and destroy? Who are you? Oh, Lord, that judge another. Who are you? He says, you can't judge. He didn't give us that kind of wisdom. He didn't give us that kind of knowledge and understanding. A person, you can be, uh, you can be judging a person, and that person could be crying out to God for a change. And you're judging God's child. What are you saying? The Lord said, he said, the church cannot do the thing that they've been doing all along at this stage in life. Look at your neighbor and say, somebody's got to change. <laughs> and so, verse 12, I've read that. Look at verse 15. Verse 14. Verse 13, go to now, you that say today or tomorrow, we'll go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on tomorrow. What is your life? 
It's even a bubble, a vapor, on, and that appear for a little time and then vanish away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. What are you saying, Brother Herring? Okay, in, in, in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, James implied that there are degrees of judgment. Some, the teachers, those that assume the role of teachers, are going to be judged in a stricter sense because they have more knowledge and understanding concerning the word of God, or they're supposed to, right? And so the truths are opened up to them, and when the truths are opened up to them, then they're going to be responsible for the truth. So he said, brethren, not, 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 not too many of y'all ought to aspire to be a teacher or teachers. Because your judgment, will, your, your judgment will be greater than the person that was not a teacher or never aspired to be a teacher. He said, we all offend in so many things. But if a person doesn't offend with his mouth, there's the perfect person. And able to bridle the whole body. Wow. Don't it just make you want to control your speech? You know, if, if, you, if you go this week, if I happen to run into you and you've got a piece of tape over your mouth, I'll understand. I might just have some tape over mine. You know what I'm saying? Isn't that right? <laughs> but the idea is clear, what James is saying. I'm going to give you three scriptures in Proverbs, and I'm bringing this to a conclusion. Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15, 28. Proverbs fifteen twenty eight. The heart of the righteous studies to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pour out evil things. A person that is wise, they think before they speak. A person that is wise. They ponder, they think about what they say. But a person that's unwise or a foolish person, they just belts it out. Whatever comes up, it comes out. Because they're not wise. So Paul or the writer James said, so you take that person that has learned to control his speech. Is a mature person. They're mature because they understand that death and life comes from the power or through the power of the tongue. We're made in the image of God, and sometimes we can curse somebody or we can bless them. But we'll be held responsible for who we curse. Isn't that right? We'll be held responsible. So death and life is in the power of our tongue. Somebody's been wondering why don't things don't change. Listen to what the word is saying. I feel like this is a very, very vital thing that God is saying to us. Over the years, he's been dealing with me about this thing. I started studying James one time before. And the Lord said at times that you need to begin to teach on the tongue and words. Words carry power. We have to learn to control our speech. Now, if I'm going to learn to control my speech, I'm going to have to allow God to doctor on my heart. It ain't going to change unless... I allow him to get the anger, the bitterness, 
the hate, the resentment out of my heart. It ain't going to change. I don't care how much I desire. But when God gets it out of our hearts, the anger that some brother, some sister, some dad, or some uncle, or somebody's done to us, or some aunt, or some grandmother, somebody done to us, or some brother or sister, somebody years ago, and we hadn't really dealt with that trauma properly, and so the anger stemming from that is still in our craw, and God is saying, he said, I know what you like, I know what you, but I'm asking you to let me help you because I know what to do for you. I can handle it. I know what you, i am not been out of shape. I'm not a, 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 a person that's not well adjusted. I can handle what you've been through. But you must trust me enough to allow me to heal you. Let me go there where this preacher did you wrong. Let me go there. One person had a situation where the preacher, preacher tried to molest her in baptism. Preachers don't always do right. Preachers are supposed to do right. But preachers don't, and preachers should do right. But there's no guarantee they do do right. Isn't that right? So that preacher hurts you. But don't take it out on me. I didn't do that to you. Okay, I'm just make, I'm trying to make a point. I ain't saying that somebody out here did this to me. I'm only trying to make a point. The point of let's allow God to visit this past. And if we allow him to visit the past where somebody hurt us and did us wrong, it'll change us. And the Lord said to me that some people have never been loved. That's what he said. Some have never been loved. They've existed, but they've never truly been loved. That's what he said. He said some people have never experienced true peace. And all that comes from God. Isn't that right? God gives peace and he loves us. He wants to love us. And he'll love us to, know, to the degree that it'll silence our mouths. All right. So the thing he said, the tongue is a fire. He didn't say the tongue is like a fire. It was not a matter of comparison. It was a matter of identity. He said the tongue is a fire. That's just, I, I know, saints. I know somebody was saying, boy, you can just let me get out of there, boy. I, I know the word's tough. But the point that I'm trying to make is sometimes until a person can hear it and understand for what it is. And until we can see ourselves the way God is trying to show us what he wants to correct, we prefer to remain the same. Don't let anyone go out and do the same thing. Don't let anyone do that. Totally disrespecting the Lord. Don't let anybody do that. Give credence to what the Lord is saying. We are just instruments. That's all we are. That the life and the power of God is to flow through. To get his message across. That's all we are. The message is the important thing. What is God saying? What is he saying? We must control our speech now. We cannot go on, keep doing the same thing, talking about one another. That's his body. Right? We must not do that. I remember years ago when my wife and I, my first late wife, and I've told you before, we had an argument. God said this to me. 1987, and he said it just like this emphatically. He said, Larry, now you have to see this. That's how he said it. He said, the devil is behind arguments. 
That was the day my life changed. That was the day my life changed. What do you mean? Because my eyes were open, I understood that when me and my wife get into arguments, if both of us are arguing, we both are being used of the devil. And my conclusion was, if I'm a Christian, I am not going to let the devil use me. That's just point blank. I'm not going to let him use me. He doesn't deserve that. And I don't deserve that. And I hope you'll be right along with me. Before you attempt to argue, remember the words that I'm sharing with you today. The devil is behind argument. You may feel justified, but the devil is behind arguments. Are oh, you hear what I'm saying? And once I get that, 1987, that's when my life changed. I had purpose in my heart. I said, I may, I may do a lot of things wrong, but I'm not going to knowingly let the devil use me. If I know it, if I don't know it, that's a different story, right? But once God revealed to me and I get mad, I'm going to hold my peace. If I have to walk away, if I have to go in my closet, I'm going to do it. Because I'm not going to be used of the devil. You know what I'm saying? God brought me out of the devil. Isn't it right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> He brought me out of darkness. So the tongue is a fire. Must we re remember what the tongue is and not let that tongue with that unruly evil rule my life. Amen. And then he talks, the last half of chapter three deals with the wisdom, earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. Earthly wisdom rests on lies and the bad use of the tongue. It divides people sows hatred and jealousy. Heavenly wisdom fosters or brings about healthy human relationships and peace with others. When people are not praying sufficiently and paying attention, sufficient attention to God's word, their actions will spring from earthly wisdom. And James said, earthly wisdom benefit demons what then is the problem what is the problem then okay brother Harry you saying all this here you talking to Christians is the Lord talking to us Christians I mean wait a minute where is where's this, this message of grace and love why are you talking about this God is saying the tongue is really hindering a lot of my people and I want it to change Okay, all right. Concluding, what then is the problem here? What is the problem? James, chapter 4. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? You lust and you have not, you kill, desire to have, cannot obtain, you fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask it amiss or wrong that you may consume it upon your lusts. Adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is the enmity of God? So whoever therefore would be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. What then is the problem? Unsatisfied desires within the person. Worldly mindedness. What do you do, Brother Herring? The other part of this part of that he mentions is verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The devil is in it because we're not submitting to the Lord in these areas. Are you hearing? So the devil's having a chance to do things that he has no business doing. What's your solution? What's the solution? What James saying? He said, submit to God and resist the devil. Don't try to resist the devil until you submit to God. Are you with me? You got to keep it in right order. Once I submit to God, then I have the right now to resist the devil. Because the devil is a legalist. 
As long as I'm sinning, I can try to rebuke him all I want to. He, he may even kind of step back a little bit. Maybe he's coming right back. Because he has legal ground. I hope somebody's listening here. I hope somebody's listening to what's being said. Draw nigh to God. Submit to God. You can't submit to God until you know what God is saying. If God is saying you're talking too much, then don't go around blaming somebody else for your troubles. Stop talking so much. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Stop talking. Now, I know this is tough, but it keeps coming up. Stop talking so much. Isn't that right? Yeah. Look at somebody say, hush. It's got to be, shh, be quiet. Stop talking so much. Because in the multitude of words, there lacketh not sin. If I'm talking so much, I can have a, a right heart, but sooner or later I'm going to sin with my mouth because I'm talking so much. I increase the chances of sinning when I talk so much. You got to hear what I'm saying. If I want to deal with that, then I need to learn to close my mouth. All right. Concluding. What the Lord hates. In the book of Proverbs 16, 27, he said these things that the Lord hates. He mentions six things and then he mentions seven. He said, yea, seven are an abomination to the Lord. Hands that shed innocent blood. Person runs swift to, mis to, to, to mischief. But the seventh, he says six things the Lord hate, but seven is a completion of an abomination. He says, he that backbiteth or he that sows discord among brethren. God hates that. God loves harmony, right? Let me share this. And then I've got the last thing I want to say, and it doesn't take but a minute. It's concerning the times that are, we are in. God doesn't want us to be troubled about the times we're living in. And I think that's the last scripture I'm going to read. But before I share this, there's a very well-known person, artist, singer. And um, I want to be very careful that I don't say anything that can, so if this person is anywhere around in the community or country, they can hear it and feel like, know that I'm speaking of them. But they were given an assignment to choose a lot of the famous gospel singers. And so they were given this project. They were going to have a sing fest. And I was at the other church at this time before I started pastoring. And the, 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 these artists were known well known in our nation. And he got seven of the top artists, I believe, and to be on this sing fest. And so uh, we're at the other church. My pa I was there in the office with the pastor and and this person was the liaison. And he was there talking, and I think he was kind of trying to solicit my uh, pastor's support. And he shared about these artists, but one in particular. And he shared about the character of this artist. And he said, I will never, ever again deal with these artists. Basically, he said their character was deplorable. But the one in particular he shared 
He described this person's action and activity. I had not started pastoring. But in my mind, that was over 40 years ago. And one of the hardest things that I've had to do is to get that image out of my mind about this person's character. They sang so well. They performed so well as a Christian. But my mind always went to the slander, the defamation of character that this person gave. I wished many times I had never heard it. And more recently, I came to the Lord and said, God, I am so sorry that I had to be in the company of this person that defamed this person. It was probably true. But what it did to me, 40 years trying to look at that person in a different light. I could no longer enjoy their music. What are you saying? I'm saying when we defame others that have influence, we do the kingdom of God a grave injustice because sometimes others may come in the sea and have an opportunity to get help. But if they're visited by a slander or defamation of character, you don't know how hard it is for them to ever overcome that image that was painted concerning that person. But God knows. And that's why he earnestly warns us not to defame people's character. I don't care what they're like. But if they're in a position of influence, don't you dare set your mouth on them and slander them before others that may could find some help. But because of your mouth, they cannot objectively see that person sufficiently to get some help. And I said to the Lord, I wish a thousand times I had never been in that company to hear this. I'm concluding. And the Lord shares, and this is not about the message but conclusively, the Lord said, all of the things that are happening in our world, this is including COVID, this is including the fires, this is including Afghanistan, Taliban, the ISIS crisis, Russia, China, you name it. It's including everything that's going on. The Lord said, there are going to be wars and rumors of wars, pestilence in various places, troubles, things are going to happen. He said, but see that you be not troubled because these things must come to pass. So in conclusion, I'm saying to each one of you, don't you be troubled about what's going on in this world. Keep your focus. God doesn't want us to be troubled about the things. They must happen. He said all of these things are the beginnings of sorrows. But one day everybody's going to look up and they're going to see the Son of God appearing in the sky. But he said when you see all these things happening... He said, look up, lift up your head because your redemption is drawing nigh. I want you to stand, let's give God some praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God, hallelujah, Jesus.
Our time, our time is almost up on the earth. God, I thank you. Our time is almost up. We look at the signs. We know that your coming is very soon. But you told us don't be troubled in mind. And God says he wants peace in our minds and our hearts. Said a lot today. One thing I believe with all of my heart. God cares for you and I. I look back over some of the messages years ago and I see where God was trying to warn his people. I see where some paid no attention to it. But the things that he say, they truly will happen. And I hope today that something was said to make you more acutely aware of the times we're living in. And the devastation of evil and the tendency, the destructive tendency of the tongue. That will govern ourselves accordingly. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you. I've said what you gave me, and I hope I've said no more. I pray for the body, I pray for the saints, Lord, those that are hearing by way of television. I pray now, dear God, for the mercies of God. I pray, Lord God, that uh, we'll, like the sons of Issachar, discern the times that we're living in, destructible times, dangerous times, and that we'll walk accordingly. Holy Father, we give you praise.